So I'm going to call tables again at random, but please be on, on ready to go. So firstly, can I call on table one, table seven, and table 13? One, seven, and 13, if you can have your questions ready. So firstly, table one, please. Can I get your attention, please, folks? Table one, thank you. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, it's just a general question, really, in relation to pubs, nightclubs, concert venues. Um, do they have a role in uh, drug prevention, as in taking out known people that are dealing in their premises? And um, actually known users as well that would be entering their premises? I know that lots of the nighttime economy places now, they get grant payments uh, from government. Um, so is there any link or any pressure that could be put on in that regard? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll come back to that now with Nikki in a second. So, table seven. No question. Table 13, please, and then maybe table 11. Um, in relation to people's long-term recovery and, and secondary treatments, um, noting we say self-help groups and recovery is usually a lifelong process. Do you have any um, statistics or data in relation to that? So I can just clarify one last time in relation to recovery? Yeah, pe people's long-term recovery, so we say we um, there's a significant number of people use Simon, so do they stay on your books or how, is there people cr progressing or moving on in all the agencies? That's very helpful, no, thank you. And uh, Sorry, 11, please, table 11. Yeah, we'd like to ask a question in relation to the drug testing at the festivals. Um, we're just wondering, did you have a target for levels of engagement? Did you reach that target? And what challenges did you face in, a, in terms of establishing trust with the people who you wanted to submit samples? And did you learn anything from that and things you could do differently in the future? Thank you. So I'll go to Nikki first on a range of questions there. Nikki, just relate to uh, the nighttime activity and your approach, please. Yeah, no worries. So I suppose to address the first question in terms of policing, I suppose there's very detailed policing uh, plans for every event. So I suppose to operate a healthy nighttime economy or healthy you know, festivals, we do need to work. There needs to be health and justice at the table. We all have different roles. Uh, so policing is operated, you know, there, there's that operation, I won't get, get into too much detail, that's the, you know, our Gardaí on Gardaí Khan responsibility. I suppose just in terms of what we do, we have an agreement that we have safe spaces where people can get health interventions. So generally at every festival, the medical tent or a drug tent or the HSE tent is a space that isn't policed. Uh, it's, it's where you can come, you can chat, you can get non-judgmental support, uh, of course, unless there's a public order incident. Um, in terms of grants and resources, I mean, you know, the expansion of this to, to other uh, areas and other festivals will need support. It will need uh, to be resourced. This is a pilot and it, it's run across um, a number of events now, but to expand on that, it, it does need greater funding. We will look, I suppose, with our colleagues in HSE Emergency Management to look at licences and harm reduction being part of festival licences to see what we can do. I mean, the festivals do environmental prevention. They'll have free water, they'll have sit-down spaces, uh, they will share harm reduction. So there's many things that they can do, even if we're not on site. They can make the space feel very safe, they can make it welcome, they can encourage getting medical help. We did research in 2019 with Trinity College Dublin uh, we got about 1,100 uh, respondents who use drugs in festivals and we found high levels of use, high levels of mixing, but they are afraid to get medical help. They are afraid. There's, there's a lot of unknowns and we see that on the ground. We do a lot of work encouraging people to get medical help. They're afraid of uh, what will happen to them if they do present. So festivals can encourage, you know, accessing help even if there isn't harm reduction on site. Um, the second question in relation to our response and our targets, um, I suppose this is a very novel response for Ireland. We, we did review other countries, we looked at all the different approaches which is postal, front of house, back of house, office based, based testing. I suppose the back of house uh, usually is uh, done by law enforcement, so drugs that are seized or drugs by medics or amnesty bins at the entry point. What's a little bit different about our approach is 
we don't have bins in isolation. Every person that puts something in that bin gets a health intervention. So if there isn't an alert about the substance, that person is still leaving with the information they need to know tailored to them. So we'll ask things like, are you using prescription medication? How are you going to use this? So that's a little bit different with ours. So we'd no targets. We didn't know how it was going to go. Uh, we didn't know if people would engage or not. There was some media miscommunication ahead of Electric Picnic last year, uh, which meant that people were quite concerned to use our service. I suppose our volunteers were out there chatting with people uh, you know sharing the message sharing how it was going to work and over time the trust did build and we did notice that once people saw our alerts on the main screens once people engaged with our volunteers they saw what we were there to do and they understood it and um, I'll be honest I was completely blown away by our first festival this year of the trust that people had uh, we were busy non-stop for the whole nine hours it's really difficult to quantify how many people we're engaging with because it's very fast paced so you're not you're not accounting for everything but we gave out over a thousand water bottles over a thousand lip balm and that's just a small representation of the, the amount of people we were engaging with and um, people were happy to come into our tent they wanted to submit the drugs either just to know in case there was something in circulation some people just wanted to support the approach and help the HSE know more about drugs and some people gave drugs because of medical emergencies so the trust has definitely built with some populations uh, which is amazing to see we had concerns at one of the events on some of the days about certain types of drugs and we, we discussed this on outreach and we discussed it with people and they said no problem I'll get you you know we can look talk with people on the campsite if we see the pink powder that you're concerned about and they did the public said okay the HSE are concerned about this let's give it to them let's let them analyze it let's see what's in it so there's a two-way learning from ourselves and the public which is actually amazing to see and I suppose I think it will grow over time so this is our second summer uh, this is a pilot phase but we will be writing reports and reviewing and getting feedback from the public as we progress. Thanks, Nikki, and very comprehensive. And Tara, just on the second question, was, which was related, I know it's a really important one for the members, the issue of um, long-term success rates. When people do access the service, what is the kind of indicators or benchmarks of long-term success? I might ask the three of you, but start with Catherine, just and then Tony and Gary. Just, mm -hmm. just briefly, any indications of measures of success? So in our um, long-term accommodation services and our independent housing services, we've got a 98% sustainment rate for people um, in our services. So that's a very high rate of stability and people making sure that they're continuing um, that security and that stability. So it can work and it has worked. Um, we have a about a 31% repeat percentage on our detox service and that can take multiple times for people just to move through the services and occasionally they'll have a slip and then they're back to the start. So it'll depend, but generally last year it was only a 31% repeat, um, which will give you a sense that the other 69% are moving through the services and into other services. Um, with our bloodborne virus unit on the stabilization piece, we've got a 100% success rate and stability um, of people who leave that service after they've come in and engaged with the service. Um, so it's certainly the Thanks. harm reduction and the abstinence-based pro projects are all having a key dip impact. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, very impressive. Um, Gary, can I ask you? Um, a, a bit like the Kerry farmer. Um, if you're going to, if you're going somewhere, don't start from here. Um, when we talk about recovery and that whole recovery process, it's very often from a male perspective. And I think if we're going to look at women, um, we have to really assess. Um, how she is doing and, and against her complex issues. And so things like um, engagement with family and, and keeping children, um, not reoffending, uh, and then reducing drug use as trauma is being dealt with, um, that's, they're the kind of measures um, that we need to be looking at when it comes to working with women. And uh, once we uh, allow for the fact that recovery for women is much slower than it is for men, then um, when you provide those kind of services, then recovery rates are very high. So we've, um, I don't have the figures here in front of me, but we would have very high uh, rates. Thanks, Gary. Tony? Yeah, so, so firstly, treatment is, is not recovery. Recovery is something that, that happens after treatment um, and is, needs a, a, a completely different um, approach, I think, in Ireland. Uh, uh, there was a, um, an event on Thurs Thursday, Saturday, wasn't it? Thursday, um, in, the north, in, in Trinity, uh, around a pilot in, in the northeast in the city of Dublin uh, to look at uh, developing uh, recovery capital 
uh, amongst amongst people who, who, who use drugs um, and we were discussing there things like what what will we record in terms of an outcome and, and success and what do people need to be doing to um, to build recovery capital so training jobs housing you know the stuff that often we don't talk about uh, that we should be talking about and they're the things that um, maintain recovery as defined by the person so whether it's stabilization or become an abstinent um, and uh, and I think that we should keep an eye on what's going on in the northeast in the city of Dublin in that regard and um, yeah uh, I suppose that's what I just wanted thank to you. mention about recovery. Thank you Tony and you are right it's more complex than a, yep. a figure or there's lots of interdependencies. Okay can I go to table six two and twelve please six first of all please. This question is addressed to Gary. Gary, is it still the procedure that women and children in domestic violence situations have to leave and find a refuge? And why is the perpetrator not arrested? Thank you. Um, number two. Hi, thank you, guys. Um, uh, my question is to Gary. Uh, what is currently happening to a child when their mother is willing to take a, voluntarily take a treatment? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll come down now in just one second. Table 12. Hi. Yeah, just a question for Catherine Kenny on the new 100-bed rehab unit. Congrats on that. Sounds great. Um, just wondering what the acceptance criteria into that is, the length of stay, uh, whether it's a family-based model, and what would be the return to normal society after that? Great question, and thank you again. So, Gary, I'm going to go to you for the first two questions. Uh, what happens to the, the child and children, and also the issues of refuge and the perpetrator, and then uh, Catherine and the one under bed unit? Um, unfortunately, we still expect the woman to do something about um, the fact that she's the victim of a crime. Um, we certainly have better laws now and more responsive and better trained guardi, and that's fantastic. Um, but I think we are often overly bothered about the perpetrator um, uh, and he's not always um, going to be arrested for the crime, particularly where um, addiction is concerned, uh, often the threat of I'll tell everybody about your drug use uh, kind of um, stops women maybe following through with all of the procedures that they might go through with. Um, so unfortunately, yes. The difficulty is, is that there aren't always spaces in refuges. And then um, if a woman is known to be um, a person who uses drugs, um, she might be excluded from a refuge because the staff there don't feel able to, to manage her, um, her drug use. So often a woman will try to present and then will return home um, uh, into that danger. Um, in terms of a woman willing to take treatment and then what happens to her child, it really depends on the different teams and what supports are around and what sometimes you will have very good um, social capital in that family members will be there to support her and encourage her and sometimes she is all alone. And uh, if she decides to go for treatment, um, then that is a risk because treatment doesn't always work first time around. And so then she has shone a light on herself. And I remember when um, the uh, minister with responsibility for the drugs task, uh, drugs um, strategy came to visit sale one year, one woman said, my daughter is 19, now it's my turn. And that she had basically waited until her child was um, through childhood and couldn't be taken into care before she tried treatment. No. Catherine, are you okay on the other um, questions? With regards to the 100 bed um, medical facility, there will be a range of different services in it. So we'll have a alcohol and um, benzodiazepine detox piece. So access to that will be obviously a reliance on misuse of alcohol and benzodiazepines. Um, our bloodborne virus unit is aimed particularly at HIV and Hep C. So that will be a requirement um, and it's a stabilisation on uh, for that service. Our step up, step down is a service because people experiencing homelessness often find it difficult to access treatment in hospitals. They need a place to stabilise it before they go into hospital and they need a place to go to after they finish their surgery or their treatment in hospital. So therefore, 
that that service will be through you're either expecting to go into hospital for some reason or you're coming out of hospital and going back into emergency accommodation or rough sleeping isn't an appropriate option and we're also introducing a rapid access and um, detox which will reduce the waiting time and then we'll have recovery um, services by virtue of the fact that there's no value in providing people with a detox option um, if you're, there's no recovery and they're going back into the same situation as they had been before. It's obviously always very challenging for people to um, succeed in that environment. So we then have an 18 month recovery program that would complement that piece so that people aren't going back into their accommodation. But it's a homeless specific service so homelessness will be a key access criteria. Tony? Yeah, if, I, if I just take the opportunity to talk about uh, accessible services, just to give you a quick scenario, team down in, our team down in the Midwest um, often have to drive to Beaumont, not a million miles from here, um, hospital to get an assessment done and drive back to Limerick. Um, and that's just for the assessment. And then if a, a space comes up, in a few weeks' time, they drive them back up and they get them in, they drive back down. That drive is, you know, obviously two staff in a car up with the person back down, maybe six hours, so a whole day gone. Um, we need those services, um, those types of those stabilization detox beds right around the country. So it's not fair to have people having to leave their homes and their counties to, to access services. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. Okay, and thanks to the panellists for being nice and prompt on the responses. It helps us get through more. So table three, table eight, and table 14. Table three. Victoria. Um, my question is for Tony. Um, how much demand do you, do you find for your service? Um, is there similar services in areas other than Dublin and the Midwest? Thank you. Uh, Okay. Um, can, we, can we just take oh, sorry, two or three sorry, questions? Sorry, 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 yeah, sorry, no sorry, problem. Yeah, I know yeah. you're anxious to go. One second. Uh, table eight, please. No question. No question. Fourteen. Um, our question is around data. We're wondering if, you, if, if there is data available on the numbers of agencies there are, both voluntary and uh, state. Um, what the overlap is among them, and then an aggregate cost of providing all of those services. Yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, well, yeah. Just, um, I will. Just, we might have one more table four, please. Hi, uh, more a question towards Tony Duffin. Uh, just wondering, um, what experiences does outreach services have regarding pushback from communities? maybe from addicts who are hostile to offers of help, or maybe communities who don't, like oper or don't want drug services operating in their locality due to stigma or? Yep. Okay, so there's a few questions for Tony, just the demand for services, availability of services in other areas, uh, community reaction, uh, etc. The question on related to how many voluntary and statutory agencies uh, are there, what's the cost, what's the investment? I might put Jim on guard, uh, Jim, from the department, just to respond to that in a couple of minutes. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll firstly go to Tony, please. Oh, okay, thank you. So on the demand for, for services in Dublin and, and the Midwest, um, sorry, I don't have, have the figures uh, uh, to hand, but to describe it to you, um, the team are out. Um, we, we have full case loads. Um, each member of staff takes uh, 20 cases in terms of case management. Um, the the, we have we have 80 staff, um, and they and in Dublin they'll 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 visit uh, private emergency accommodation providers and, and the homeless hostels and stuff to, to provide direct services to them. Um, and nursing staff are absolutely flat out with with really uh, seriously um, serious. I wouldn't say chronic because people who are chronic need to be up in the hospital, but, but you know, very serious sort of health issues in terms of abscesses and, and compression bandages and these kinds of things. So it's a really busy service. Um, uh, we, would, we would see um, thousands of people in, in, the, in the course of a year. Um, it's a smaller service in the Midwest, uh, and we cover, uh, we do a lot of work in, in, in Limerick where the lion's share of the work is, but we do cover the Midwest and the van that we have with us. That goes, that we have one down there, we go out around there, we have a number of vehicles moving around. Uh, so we have 10 staff down there. Um, so it's a, it's a busy service. We don't have, 
uh, awaiting this per se because we do focus on you know um, moving people along um, as best we can um, and um, yeah so so and we prioritize people obviously so that's that's just about demand um, in terms of um, the community pushback um, so um, how do I want to I mean obviously there's nimbyism obviously there's another thing called notism so it's not in my backyard and not over there either um, People like what we do in terms of harm reduction and engaging with people and helping people. People like that, but not, not here. You know that, that kind of attitude. It's incumbent upon us as as a as a service provider to do our best job by the community as well as by the the people who who we serve. Um, so we do do we do focus on a, a good neighbourhood policy and we do uh, engage. Uh, for example, at 48 and 51 Middle Abbey Street in Dublin, um, our nearest neighbour is Arnott's. We know uh, the team there. We talk to them. This is a very high-profile business on our doorstep. We engage with them really positively. Um, and we ask the people who use our services to, to, they have to, to remind them that they have rights and they have responsibilities as well and to respect uh, neighbours and such. So there is, there is a lot of work that goes into that, and it is incumbent upon the service provider to, to be... It's like you want to be... The area has to be a better area because you're there, not there, not worse. You know? I don't know if that helps. Can I just come in on that? Yeah. Um, communities can also be a great a advocate um, yeah. and a source of information. So certainly there's Nimbyism and there's certainly um, occasional groups that will object to the services going into their area. But the communities can also be a huge asset. Um, and we find that people report into us and um, our outreach team to say there's somebody here, they need help, or yeah. they'll look to get involved. So there, there's certainly the pushback, but also there's great engagement from communities as well. And I think we need to capitalise on that as well, that kind of good nature. Thanks for that, Catherine. That's good to hear too. So, Jim Walsh, I kind of put you on the spot, but it was, the question was around the investment in this area and the number of statutory voluntary community organisations. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. So the department funds 280 uh, drug and alcohol services um, in conjunction with the drug and alcohol task forces. That's 280 services, and the investment every year is around 31 million. In addition to that, the HSC also provides funding for voluntary services, another 24 million. Uh, on top of that, and again, we have funding for 50 residential services. Uh, my point though, I think going back earlier on was we have a patchwork quilt network of services and we need to see can we harness those services and those structures in a more efficient manner as they did in Cork. Thank you. Hi, James, sorry, while, while you're on a roll, um, just the total investment in drugs related services from, from the department and HSE. Uh, it's in a region of 140 million. Okay. Uh, there's another 80, 82 million directly through the HSE on top of that. So we'll add all those up. You're around the 140, 145 million. Thank you, Jim. Per annum. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I can't say time, but I do want to be try to be fair to, and capture. I have four tables left, as I understand we haven't. So can I ask very briefly, and we'll see how much we can get with tables 9, 5, 10, and 15. So 9, first of all. And again, I'll ask the panellists to be very brief on responses. Hi, so uh, this is really directed to anyone. Uh, anyone can answer. Uh, so just to highlight a few things about this country, we have an extremely high cost of living. Uh, planners have so much power that nearly everyone gets rejected when trying to build a home. The entire country has no connection, very little pu uh, public transport, and just transport across the country, which has resulted in Ireland having the highest rate of loneliness. And of course, we have the controversies, even with lack of transparency in the likes of RT. And all these kinds of things now that has obviously contributed to a low quality of life in Ireland. If we address these issues, would they help uh, stopping people resorting to drugs as a form of escapism? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you. Very good question. Uh, yes, so I'll come back to that in just a second. So table five and then ten and fifteen. No ten group. Okay, table ten, please. Um, I guess our question was just around how do you guarantee that service users 
feel safe coming into the services without um, intervention of other agencies such as TUSLA or the Gardaí. Thank you. Okay, and table 15. Hi there, it's just about the Simon community. Um, you said you had a 98% success rate, and we're just wondering what sort of time frame that's based on. Like, do you check in with people maybe two years after they've finished with your program? Or is there any ongoing checking in with them to make sure that they're still kind of clean, so to speak? Thank you, Jesse. Okay, so I'll take the chairman's prerogative here and I'll point the questions. The Simon one, obviously, we'll put to Catherine. The issue of the wider societal issues and how they might uh, end up with people trying to a level of escapism and get away from some of the issues that is hurting society, uh, I, I'll point as well. And then, can safety be guaranteed? So maybe just take the first and first and the whole wider societal issues and the level of uh, escapism that might relate to drugs issue. Can I ask maybe, um, actually, maybe Gary just on that one, please. Thanks very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, you summarised Ireland nicely there. Um, and drug use is part of how people are responding. Um, it's not surprising that people will use drugs when there's high levels of loneliness. So I think when we're responding, it's a both and approach. If we're not addressing our mental health, our well-being, um, how we in general um, respond to our loneliness and isolation and our high costs and all of the, the, those kind of metrics, then drug projects on their own won't be able to do anything. But if we are addressing those, then drugs projects can do a lot of work. And I think lots of the people who come into our services, particularly those who identify as addicted to a substance, um, have very serious mental health and trauma stories to tell and we can do very good work with them and I think that's why if we um, are thinking in the way that you're talking which I think is a very good way of approaching it we also need to be thinking about um, the people around people who use drugs um, and supporting them in managing the feelings that are there and also as I mentioned earlier the children because they are the very ones who will follow through um, so I think without uh, drug services, I think we'd be in trouble, but drug services on their own can't do it. Thanks for Gary. Not an easy one, a very complex one indeed. Just the issue around safety being guaranteed, I know it wasn't... Um, I might just ask Tony and maybe Nikki just to, from your experience, just in the round. Yeah, so, sorry, was that safety being guaranteed for people who use drugs? Is that... Is that? Oh, 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 okay, okay. sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, so look... Um, when I started out, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how, how m much health and safety was a focus back in 1993, um, but health and safety increased uh, all, the, all the time and, and actually became a barrier to service provision for people who use drugs uh, for quite some time. But health and safety is there to help uh, include people, not exclude them. So we, we work like anybody else. We want people to be safe, uh, both staff members and, and service users. Um, and we implement policies and procedures that, that will do that. But we yeah. do that with it with in mind that we want to yeah. include people. Yeah, sorry, uh, Tony, Tony just, just to be just yeah. fair to the guys, and I, I asked Nikki as well, it was more safety of the person coming forward with the services and not ending up in other state services, for example, Tusla or in Gardaí. Okay, yeah, okay. so mm. I suppose in terms of, of our, our service, it's a pop-up service that will be at nominated events. And in the lead up to those events, we have quite detailed meetings with the event organisers, HSE Emergency Management, Professor Keenan, who you heard from earlier on, and on Garda Síochána. So I suppose our plans and policies are in place to ensure that the health setting is a safe space for people to come into. We're in constant communication throughout the event. We're monitoring the situation throughout the event, and we guarantee that our services are safe for people to come. Uh, and I suppose people, people do have concerns. We meet them, we meet them where they're at. We listen to their concerns, and we explain how the programme works uh, but I suppose it is part of our policy and part of that really important relationship uh, between the HSE and Gardaí and as I said it is a very good example of both agencies with different main core objectives working on a health-led response. And sorry Tony again mm -hmm. I just want to do justice to your own organisation as well the you have confidential case study discussions with Gardaí as well do you want to just give us a flavour of how that might operate? 
Yeah, sure. So, so the guards make referrals to Analifi uh, on the LEAR program, the Law Engagement System Recovery. We, um, we have a shared confident confidentiality uh, agreement that the person, when, when the time comes and they want to, they will, they will sign. Um, and it's, it's, it's working around the, the case management piece where you're looking at goals and such, having case management meetings every, every two weeks or so, and, um, and working on the goals. And the guards understand that this is not about, you know, um, uh, criminal activity or, or, or gathering uh, intelligence. This is about helping the individual, uh, and they do a great job in working with us, which is quite unique, really, when you think about it. We're a harm reduction service that works with people who actively use drugs, and the guards work with us on finding solutions for them, other than you know going to court or anything like that. You know, so it's good. Thank you, and Catherine. Finally, can I just ask you in the long-term kind of tracking of the benefits, the 98% figure, but but generally long-term tracking of it. The 98% is in our housing, um, specifically. So we would ha we would track that on an annual basis. So we, by virtue of the fact that they're in our housing, um, we're they're living in our units. So we would track them. 12, year, 12 months, 5 years, 10 years, um, and some people, that's their final um, accommodation. Um, so we, we would have, and that would be over the whole breadth of our accommodation services. Um, so it's an ongoing track, uh, but we would capture it on a monthly basis. Um, but we, a minimum to be considered is 12 months. So you have to be stable and in there to be considered successful for more than 12 months. Okay, can I just say to our panellists just a couple of things, just first of all, thanks for all the work that you do with your organisations and with your teams, I mean it is an amazing commitment, uh, highly qualified people, highly committed people who commit their careers to working with the most vulnerable people in our society and it's nothing but commendable, so thanks to you and your organisations for all that you do. Yeah.